Chapter 8 of The Mystic Will. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mystic Will by Charles Godfrey Leland. Chapter 8 The Constructive Faculties. He who hath learned a single art can thrive, I ween, in any part. German Proverb He would have taught you how you might employ yourself, and many did to him repair, and certes not in vain, he had inventions rare. Wordsworth When I had, after many years of study and research in England and on the continent, developed the theory that all practical, technical education of youth should be preceded by a light or easy training on an aesthetic basis, or the minor arts, I for four years, to test the scheme, was engaged in teaching in the city of Philadelphia, every week in separate classes, two hundred children, besides a number of ladies. These were from the public schools of the city. The total number of these public pupils was then 110,000. My pupils were taught, firstly, simple outline decorative design, with drawing at the same time. After this, according to sex, easy embroidery, wood carving, modeling in clay, leather work, carpentering, inlaying, repoussé modeling in clay, porcelain painting, and other small arts. Nearly all of the pupils, who were from ten to sixteen years of age, acquired two or three, if not all, of these arts, and then very easily found employment in factories or fabrics, etc. Many people believed that this was all waste of money and time, and quite unknown to me, at their instigation, an inquiry was made of all the teachers in the public schools as to the standing of my art pupils in their other classes, it being confidently anticipated that they would be found to have fallen behind. And the result of the investigation was that the two hundred were in advance of the one hundred and ten thousand in every branch, geography, arithmetic, history, and so on. It was not remarkable, because boys and girls who had, at an average age of twelve or thirteen, learned the principles of design and its practical application to several kinds of handiwork, and knew the differences and characteristics of Gothic, Arabesque, or Greek patterns, all developed a far greater intelligence in general thought and conversation than others. They had at least one topic on which they could converse intelligently with any grown-up person, and in which they were really superior to most. They soon found this out. I have often been astonished in listening to their conversation among themselves to hear how well they discussed art. They all knew at least one thing, which is far from being known among aesthetes in London, which is that, in decorative art, However you may end in all kinds of mixtures of styles, you must at least begin with organic development, and not put roots or flowers at both ends of a branch or vine. The secret of it all is that those who from an early age develop the constructive faculty, especially if this be done in a pleasing, easy manner, with agreeable work, also develop with it the intellect and that very rapidly, to a very remarkable degree. There are reasons for this. Drawing, when properly taught, stimulates visual perception or eye memory. This is strikingly the case when the pupil has a model placed in one room, and, after studying it, goes into another room to reproduce it from memory. Original design, which when properly taught is learned with incredible ease by all children, stimulates observation to a remarkable degree. The result of such education is to develop a great general quickness of perception and thought. Now, be it observed, 
that if any one desires to learn design or any art, it may be greatly facilitated by the application to it of will and foresight, and, in the beginning, self-suggestion. He who understands the three as one sees in it a higher or more energetic kind of self-discipline than most people practice. In the end, they come to the same as a vigorous effort of the will. Thus, having mastered the very easy principles of design, which govern all organic development or vegetable growth, as set forth in a plant with roots, offshoots, or crochets, and end ornaments, flowers, or finials, with the circle, spiral, and offshooting ornaments, rings made into vines and wave patterns, all of which can be understood in an hour with diagrams. Let the beginner attempt a design, the simpler the better, and reproduce it from memory. If, on going to bed, he will impress it on his mind that on the morrow he would like to make more designs, or that it must be done, he will probably feel the impulse and succeed. This is the more likely because patterns impress themselves very vividly on the memory or imagination, and when studied are easily recalled after a little practice. The manner in which most artists form an idea, or project their minds to a plan or invention, be it a statue or picture, and the way they think it over and anticipate it, very often actually seeing the picture in a finished state in imagination, all amounts to foresight and hypnotic preparation in a crude, imperfect form. If any artist who is gifted with resolution and perseverance will simply make trial of the method here recommended, he will assuredly find that it is a great aid to invention. It is probable that half the general average cleverness of men is due to their having learned, as boys, games, or the art of making something, or mending and repairing. In any case, if they had learned to use their hands and their inventiveness or adaptability, they would have been the better for it. That the innumerable multitude of people who can do nothing of the kind, and who take no real interest in anything except spending money and gossiping, are to be really pitied, is true. Some of them once had minds, and these are the most pitiful or pitiable of all. It is to be regretted that novels are, with rare exceptions, written to amuse this class, and limit themselves strictly to life, never describing with real skill, so as to interest anything which could make life worth living for, except love, which is good to a certain extent, but not absolutely all in all, save to the erotomaniac and as most novelists now pretend to instruct or convey ideas, beyond mere storytelling or even being interesting, which means the love or detective business, I would suggest to some of these writers that the marvelous latent powers of the human mind, and also some art which does not consist of the names and guidebook praises of a few great painters and the Renaissance rechauffé, would be a refreshing novelty. The ancient Romans were thoroughly persuaded that exercitatione et usu, by exercising the physical faculties in every way, by which they meant art as well as gymnastics, and by making such practice habitual, they could develop intellect, in illustration of which Lycurgus once took two puppies of the same litter, and had the one brought up to hunt while the other was nursed at home in all luxury. And when grown and let loose, the one caught a hare, while the other yelped and ran away. So the word handy, in Old English hend, meaning quick, alert, or gifted with prompt perception, is derived from knowing how to use the hands. Brusonius, in his Facitiae, Leon, 1562, 
has collected a great number of classic anecdotes to illustrate this saying. Recapitulation Those who desire to become artists can greatly facilitate their work if beginning, for example, with very simple outline decorative designs, and, having learned the principles on which they are constructed, they would repeat or revise them to themselves before sleep, resolving to remember them. The same principle is applicable to all kinds of designs, with the proviso that they be at first very easy. This is generally a very successful process. Forethought, or the projection of conception or attention with will, is a marvelous preparation for all kinds of artwork. He who can form the habit of seeing a picture mentally before he paints it has an incredible advantage and will spare himself much labor and painting out. End of chapter 8《Of the Mystic Will. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roz Mason. The Mystic Will by Charles Godfrey Leland. Chapter 9 Fascination. Querit Franciscus. Valesius del Rio Gutierrez et Alli, unde vulgaris ilia fascini nata sit opinio de oculo fascinante, visione et ore fascinando laudando. De face natione, fatatus, A.D. 1677. I have in chapter 5th mentioned several of the subjects to attain which the will may be directed by the aid of self-hypnotism, preceded by forethought. If the reader has carefully studied what I have said, and not merely skimmed it, he must have perceived that if the power be fully acquired, it makes, as it were, new existence for its possessor, opening to him boundless fields of action, by giving him the enviable power to acquire interest that is to say, agreeable or profitable occupation, in whatever he pleases. In further illustration of which, I add the following. To recall bygone memories, or imperfectly remembered sensations, scenes, and experiences, or images. This is a difficult thing to describe, and no wonder, since it forms the greatest and most trying task of all poets to depict that which really depends for its charm on association, emotion, and a chiaroscuro of feelings. We have all delightful reminiscences which make ridiculous Dante's assertion that there is no greater grief than to recall in pain the happy days gone by, which, if true, would make it a matter of regret that we ever had a happy hour. However, I assume that it is a great pleasure to recall, even in grief, beautiful bygone scenes and joys, and trust that the reader has a mind healthy and cheerful enough to do the same. What constitutes a charm in many memories is often extremely varied. Darkly shaded rooms with shutters closed in on an intensely hot American summer day, Chinese matting on the floors, the mirrors and picture frames covered with tulle, silence, the scent of magnolias all over the house, the presence of loved ones now long dead and gone. All of these combined form to me memory pictures in which nothing can be spared. The very scent of the flowers is like musk in a perfume or bouquet of odors. It fixes them well or renders them permanent. And it is all like a beautiful, vivid dream. If I had my life to live over again, I would do frequently and with great care what I thought of too late, and now practice feebly. I would strongly impress on my mind 
and very often recall many such scenes, pictures, times, or memories. Very few people do this. Hence, in all novels and poems, especially the French, description generally smacks of imitation and mere manufacture. It passes for beautiful writing, but there is always something in really unaffected truth from nature which is caught by the true critic. I read lately a French romance which is much admired of this manufactured or second-hand kind. Every third page was filled with the usual botany, rocks, skies, colors, fore and backgrounds, all very fine, but in the whole of it not one of those little touches of truth which stir us so in Shakespeare make us smile in Herrick, or naive peeps, or raise our hearts in Wordsworth. These were true men. To be true, we must be far more familiar with nature than with scene painting or photographs, and to do this we must, so to speak, fascinate ourselves with pictures in life, glad memories of golden hours, rock and river and greenwood tree, we must also banish resolutely from our past all recollections of enemies and wrongs, troubles and trials, and throw all our heart into doing so. Forgive and forget all enmities, those of misfortune and fate being included. Depend upon it that the brighter you can make your past, the pleasanter will be your future. This is just the opposite to what most people do. Hence the frequent and fond quotation of pessimistic poetry. It is all folly and worse. One result is that in modern books of travel the only truthful or vivid descriptions are of sufferings of all kinds, even down to inferior luncheons and lost hairbrushes. Their joys they sketch with an indifferent skill, like Heine's monk, who made rather a poor description of heaven, but was gifted in hell, which he depicted with dreadful vigor. I find it a great aid to recall what I can of bygone beautiful associations, and then sleep on them with a resolve that they shall recur in complete condition. He who will thus resolutely clean up his past life, and clear away from it all sorrow, as well as he can, and refurnish it with beautiful memories, or make it better, coute que coute, will do himself more good than many a doleful moral adviser ever dreamed of. This is what I mean by self-fascination, the making, as it were, by magic art, one's own past and self more charming than we ever deemed it possible to be we thus fascinate ourselves. Those who believe that everything which is bygone has gone to the devil are in a wretched error. The future is based on the past, yes, made from it, and that which was never dies, but returns to bless or grieve. We mostly wrong our past bitterly, and bitterly does it revenge itself. But it is like the lion of Androcles, it remembers those who treat it kindly. And lo, when Androcles was thrown to the lion to be devoured, the beast lay down at his feet and licked his hands. Yes, we have all our lions. To Master Difficult Meanings It has often befallen me, when I was at the university, or later when studying law, to exert my mind to grasp and all in vain, some problem in mathematics or a puzzling legal question, or even to remember some refractory word in a foreign language which would not remain in the memory. After a certain amount of effort in many of these cases, further exertion is injurious. The mind or receptive power seems to be seized, as if nauseated, with spasmodic rejections. In such a case, pass the question by, but on going to bed, think it over 
and will to understand it on the morrow. It will often suffice to merely desire that it shall recur in more intelligible form, in which case, nota bene, if let alone, it will obey. This is as if we had a call to make tomorrow, when, as we know, the memory will come at its right time of itself, especially if we employ forethought or special pressure. When I reflect on what I once endured from this cause, and how greatly it could have been relieved or alleviated, I feel as if I could beg, with all my heart, every student or teacher of youth to seriously experiment on what I set forth in this book. It is also to be observed, especially by metaphysicians and mental philosophers, that a youth who has shown great indifference to, let us say, mathematics, if he has manifested an aptitude for philosophy or languages, will be in all cases certain to excel in the former if he can be brought to make a good beginning in it. A great many cases of bad, i.e. indifferent, scholarship are due to bad teaching of the rudiments by adults who took no interest in their pupils and therefore inspired none. To determine what course to follow in any emergency Many a man often wishes with all his heart that he had some wise friend to consult in his perplexities. What to do in a business trouble when we are certain that there is an exit if we could only find it, a sure way to tame an unruly horse if we had the secret, to do or not to do what e'er the question. Truly, all this causes great trouble in life. But it is within the power of man to be his own friend, yes, and companion, to a degree of which none have ever dreamed, and which borders on the weird, or that which forebodes or suggests mysteries to come. For it may come to pass that he who has trained himself to it may commune with his spirit as with a companion. This is, of course, done by just setting the problem, or question, or dilemma, before ourselves as clearly as we can, so as to know our own minds as well as possible. This done, sleep on it, with the resolute will to have it recur on the morrow in a clear and solved form. And should this occur, do not proceed to pull it to pieces again by way of improvement, but rather submit it to another night's rest. I would here say that many lawyers and judges are perfectly familiar with this process and use it habitually without being aware of its connection with hypnotism or will. But they could aid it if they would add this peculiar impulse to the action. What I will now discuss approaches the miraculous, or seems to do so, because it has been attempted or treated in manifold ways by sorcerers and witches. The voodoos, or black wizards in America, profess to be able to awaken love in one person for another by means of incantations, but admit that it is the most difficult of their feats. Nor do I think that there is any infallible recipe for it. But that there are means of honestly aiding such affection can hardly be denied. In the first place, he who would be loved must love. For that is no honest love, which is not sincere. And having thus inspired himself, and made himself as familiar as possible, by quietly observing, as dispassionately as may be, all the mental characteristics of the one loved. Let him, with an earnest desire to know how to secure a return, go to sleep, 
and see whether the next day will bring a suggestion. And as the old proverb declares that luck comes to many when least hoped for, so will it often happen that forethought is thus forebought or secured. It is known that gifts pass between friends or lovers to cause the receiver to think of the giver. Thus they are, in a sense, amulets. If we believe, as Heine prettily suggests, that something of the life or the being of the owner or wearer has passed into the talisman, we are not far off from the suggestion that our feelings are allied. All over Italy, or over the world, pebbles of precious stone, flint or amber, rough topaz or agate, are esteemed as lucky. All things of the kind lead to suggestiveness, and may be employed in suggestion. What was originally known as fascination, of which the German, Formann, wrote a very large volume which I possess, is simply hypnotism without the putting to sleep. It is direct suggestion. Where there is a natural sympathy of like to like, soul answering soul, such suggestion is easily established. Among people of a common, average, worldly type who are habitually sarcastic, jeering, chafing, and trifling, or those whose idea of genial or agreeable companionship is to get a rise out of all who will give and take irritations equally, there can be no sympathy of gentle or refined emotions. Experiments whose whole nature presupposes earnest thought cannot be tried with any success by those who live habitually in an atmosphere of small talk and rubbishy associations. Fascination should be mutual. To attempt to exert it on anyone who is not naturally in sympathy is a crime, and I believe that all such cases lead to suffering and remorse. But where we perceive that there is an undoubted mutual liking and good reason for it, fascination when perfectly understood and sympathetically used, facilitates and increases love and friendship, and may be most worthily advantageously employed. Unto anyone who could, for example, merely skim over all that I have written, catching an idea here and there, and then expect to master all, I can clearly say that I can give him or her no definite idea of fascination. For fascination really is effectively what the old philosophers, who had given immense study and research to the subject in ages when susceptibility to suggestiveness went far beyond anything now known, all knew and declared. That is to say, it existed, but that it required a peculiar mind and very certainly one which is not frivolous to understand its nature, and much more to master it. He who has by foresight or previous consideration of a subject or desire allied to a vigorous resolution, which is a kind of projection of the mind by will, and then submitting it to sleep, learned how to bring about a wished-for state of mind, has, in a curious manner, made, as it were, of his hidden self a conquest yet a friend. He has brought to life within himself a spirit, gifted with greater powers than those possessed by conscious intellect. By his astonishing and unsuspected latent power, man can imagine and then create even a spirit within the soul. We make at first the sketch, and then model it in clay, then cast it in gypsum, 
and finally sculpture it in marble. I read lately in a French novel a description of a young lady by herself in which she assumed to have within her two souls, one good, of which she evidently thought very little, and another brilliantly diabolical, capricious, vividly dramatic and interesting esprit, to which she gave a great deal of attention. He who will begin by merely imagining that he has within him a spirit of beauty and light, which is to subdue and extinguish the other, or all that is in him of what is low, commonplace and mean, may bring this idea to exert a marvelous influence. He can increase the conception and give it reality by treating it with forethought and will, by suggestion, until it gives marvelous result. This better self may be regarded as a guardian angel. In any case, it is a power by means of which we can learn mysteries. It is also our conscience, born of the perception of ideals. The ideal or spirit thus evolved should be morally pure, else the experimenter will find, as did the magicians of old, that all who dealt with any but good spirits fell into the hands of devils, just as Allan Kardec says is the case with spiritualists. But to speak as clearly as I can, he who succeeds in winning or creating a higher self within himself and fascinating it by sympathy will find that he has, within moral limits, a strange power of fascinating those who are in sympathy with him. Whereupon many will say, of course, like and like together strike, birds of a feather flock together, similus similibus. But it often happens in this life, though they meet, they do not pair off. Very often, indeed, they meet, but to part. There must be, even where the affinity exists, consideration and forethought to test the affinity. It requires long practice, even for keen eyes, to recognize the amethyst or topaz or many other gems in their natural state as sea-worn pebbles. Now, it is not a matter of fancy or romance or imagination that there are men and women who really have deeply hidden in their souls or more objectively manifested peculiar or beautiful characteristics or a spirit. I would not speak here merely of naivete or tenderness, a natural affinity for poetry, art, or beauty, but the particular tone and manner of it, which is sympathetic to ours. For two people may love music, yet be widely removed from all agreement if one be a Wagnerian and the other of an older school. Suffice it to say that such similarities of mind or mood, of intellect or emotion, do exist, and when they are real and not imaginary, or merely the result of passional attraction, they suggest and may well attract the use of fascination. Those who actually develop within themselves such a spirit, regarding it as one, that is, a self beyond self, attain to a power which few understand, which is practical, positive, and real, and not at all a superstitious fancy. It may begin in imagining or fancy, but as the veriest dream is material, and may be repeated till we see it visibly and can then copy it, so can we create in ourselves a being, a segregation of our noblest thoughts, a superb abstraction of soul, 
which looks from its sunny mountain height down on the dark and noisome valley which forms our worldly common intellect or mind, or the only one known to by far the majority of mankind, albeit they may have therein glimpses of light and truth. But it is to him who makes for himself, by earnest will and thought, a separate and better life or self that a better life is given. Those who possess genius or peculiarly cultivated minds of a highly moral cast, gifted with pure integrity and above vulgarity and worldly commonplace habits, should never form a tie in friendship or love without much forethought. And then, if the active agent has disciplined his mind by self-hypnotism until he can control or manage his will with ease, he will know without further instruction how to fascinate, and that properly and legitimately. Those who now acquire this power are few and far between, and when they really possess it, they make no boast nor parade, but rather keep it carefully to themselves, perfectly content with what it yields for reward. And here I may declare something in which I firmly believe, yet which very few I fear will understand as I mean it. If this fascination and other faculties like it may be called magical, albeit all is within the limits of science and matter, then there are assuredly in this world magicians whom we meet without dreaming that they are such. Here and there, however rare, there is mortal who has studied deeply, but softened all and tempered into beauty, and blended with lone thoughts and wanderings, the quest of hidden knowledge and a mind to love the universe. Such beings do not come before the world, but hide their lights, knowing well that their magic would defeat itself and perish if it were made common. Any person of the average worldly caste who could work any miracles, however small, would in the end bitterly regret it if he allowed it to be known. Thus I have read ingenious stories, for instance one by Hood, showing what terrible troubles a man fell into by being able to make himself invisible. Also another setting forth the miseries of a successful alchemist. The Algonquin Indians have a legend of a man who came to grief and death through his power of making all girls love him. But the magic of which I speak is of a far more subtle and deeply refined nature, and those who possess it are alone in life, save when by some rare chance they meet their kind. Those who are deeply and mysteriously interested in any pursuit for which the great multitude of all alike people have no sympathy, who have peculiar studies and subjects of thought, partake a little of the nature of the magus. Magic, as popularly understood, has no existence. It is a literal myth for it means nothing but what amazes or amuses for a short time. No miracle would be one if it became common. Nature is infinite, therefore its laws cannot be violated. Ergo, there is no magic, if we mean by that an inexplicable contravention of law. But that there are minds who have simply advanced in knowledge beyond the multitude in certain things which cannot at once be made common property, is true. For there is a great deal of marvelous truth not as yet dreamed of, even by Herbert Spencer's or Edison's or Röntgen's or other scientists. And yet herein is hidden the greatest secret of future human happenings. What I was is passed by, 
what I am away doth fly, what I shall be none do see, yet in that my glories be. Now to illustrate this more clearly, some of these persons who are more or less secretly addicted to magic, I say secretly because they cannot make it known if they would, take the direction of feeling or living with inexpressible enjoyment in the beauties of nature. That they attain to something almost or quite equal to life in fairyland is conclusively proved by the fact that only very rarely, here and there in their best passages, do the greatest poets more than imperfectly and briefly convey some broken idea or reflection of the feelings which are excited by thousands of subjects in nature in many. The Mariana of Tennyson surpasses anything known to me in any language as conveying the reality of feeling alone in a silent old house, where everything in a dim, uncanny manner recalled the past, yet suggested a kind of mysterious presence, as in the passage, All day within the dreary house the doors upon their hinges creaked, the blue fly sang in the pane, the mouse behind the moldering wainscot shrieked, or from the crevice peered about. Old faces glimmered through the doors, old footsteps trod the upper floors, old voices called her from without. Yet even this unsurpassed poem does no more than partially revive and recall the reality to me of similar memories of long, long ago, when, an invalid child, I was often left in a house entirely alone, from which even the servants had absented themselves. Then I can remember how, after reading The Arabian Nights or some such unearthly romance, as was the mode in the thirties, the very sunshine stealing craftily and silently, like a living thing, in a bar through the shutter, twinkling with dust, as with infinitely small stars, living and dying like sparks, the buzzing of the flies, who were little blue imps, with now and then a larger Beelzebub, a strange imagined voice ever about, which seemed to say something without words, and the very furniture, wherein the chairs were as goblins, and the broom a tall young woman, and the looking-glass a kind of other self-life. All of this, as I recall, it appears to me as a picture of the absence of human beings as described by Tennyson, plus a strange personality in every object, which the poet does not attempt to convey. This is, however, a very small or inferior illustration there are far more remarkable and deeply spiritual or aesthetically suggestive subjects than this, and that in abundance, which art has indeed so reproduced as to amaze the many who have only had snatches of such observation themselves. But the magicians, Shelley or Keats or Wordsworth, only convey partial echoes of certain subjects or of their specialties. It is indeed beautiful to feel what art can do, but the original is worth far more, and if the reader would be such a magician, let him give his heart and will to taking an interest in all that is beautiful, good and true, or honest, for that it really can be done in all fullness is true beyond a dream of doubt. By the ordinary methods of learning, one may, indeed, acquire an exact, mechanically drawn picture, which we modify with what beauty chance bestows. But he who will learn by the process which I have endeavored to describe, or by studying with the will, cannot fail to experience a strange enchantment in so doing, 
as I have read in an Italian tale of a youth who was sadly weary of his lessons, but who, being taken daily by certain kind fairies into their school on a hill, found all difficulties disappear, and the pursuit of knowledge as joyful as that of pleasure. I have heard hypnotism, with regard to fascination, spoken of with great apprehension. It is dreadful, said one to me, to think of anybody's being able to exercise such an influence on anyone, and yet, widely known as it is, instances of its abuse are very rare. Thus, when cremation was first discussed, it was warmly opposed, because somebody might be poisoned, and then, the body being burned, there could be no autopsy. Nature has decreed some drawback to the best things. Nothing is perfect. But to balance the immense benefits latent in suggestion against the problematic abuses is like condemning the ship because a bucket of tar has been spilt on the deck. Sincere kindness and respect, which are allied unto identity, are the best or surest key to love, and they, in turn, are allied to fascination. Here I might observe that the action of the eye, which is a silent speech of emotion, has always been regarded as powerful in fascination, but those who are not by nature gifted with it cannot use it to much good purpose. That emotional, susceptible subjects ready to receive suggestion can be put to sleep or made to imagine anything terrible regarding anybody's glance is very true, just as an ignorant Italian will believe of any man that he has the malocho, if he be told so. Whence came the idea that Pope Gregory XVI had the evil eye. But where there is sincere, kindly feeling, it makes itself felt in a sympathetic nature by what is popularly called magic, only because it is not understood. The enchantment lies in this, that unconscious cerebration, or the power or powers, who are always acting in us, effect many curious and very subtle mental phenomena, all of which they do not confide to the common sense waking judgment or reason, simply because the latter is almost entirely occupied with common worldly subjects. It is as if someone whose whole attention and interest had been at all times given to some plain hard drudgery should be called on to review or write a book of exquisitely subtle poetry. It is, indeed, almost sadly touching to reflect how this innocent and beautiful faculty of recognizing what is good is really acting, perhaps, in evil and merely worldly minds, all in vain and all unknown to them. The more the conscious waking judgment has been trained to recognize goodness, the more will the hidden water fairies rise above the surface, as it were, to the sunshine. So it comes that true kindly feeling is recognized by sympathy, and those who would be loved cannot do better than make themselves truly and perfectly kind by forethought and will. And with this, the process of self-hypnotism will be a great aid. For it is not more by winning others to us than in willing ourselves to them that true love consists. Love or trusting sympathy from any human being, however humble, is the most charming thing in life, and it ought to be the main object of existence. Yet there are thousands all round us, yes, many among our friends or acquaintances, who live and die without ever having known it, because in their egotism and folly 
they conceive of close relations as founded on personal power, interest, or the weakness of others. The only fascination which such people can ever exercise is that of the low and devilish kind, the influence of the cat on the mouse, the eye of the snake on the bird, which in the end degrades them into deeper evil. That there are such people, and that they really make captive and oppress weaker minds, by suggestion, is true. The marvel being that so few find it out. But in proportion, as this kind of fascination is vile and mean, that which may be called altruistic, or sympathetic attraction, or enchantment, is noble and pure, because it acquires strength in proportion to the purity and beauty of the soul or will which inspires it. It is as real and has as much power and can be exercised by any honest person whatever with wonderful effect, even to the performing what are popularly called miracles, which only means wonderful works beyond our power of explanation. But this kind of fascination is little understood as yet, simply because it is based on purity, morality, and light. And hitherto, the seekers for occult mysteries have been chiefly occupied with the gloomy and mock diabolical rubbish of old tradition, instead of scientific investigation of our minds and brains. There is also in truth a fascination by means of the voice, which has in it a much deeper and stronger power or action than that of merely sweet sound as of an instrument. The Jesuit Gaspar Schott, in his Majo Medica, treats a fascination as twofold, de fascinatione per visunt et vocem. I have found among Italian witches, as with red Indian wizards, every magical operation depended on an incantation, and every incantation on the feeling, intonation, or manner in which it is sung. Thus, near Rome, any peasant overhearing a songuracione would recognize it from the sound alone. Anyone, male or female, can have a deep, rich voice by simply subduing and training it, and very rarely raising it to a high pitch. Nota bene that the less this is affected, the more effective it will be. There are many, especially women, who speak, as it were, all time in italics, when they do not set their speech in small caps or displayed large capitals. The result of this, as regards sound, is the so-called nasal voice, which is very much like caterwauling, and I need not say that there is no fascination in it. On the contrary, its tendency is to destroy any other kind of attraction. It is generally far more due to an ill-trained, unregulated, excitable, nervous temperament than to any other cause. The training the voice to a subdued state, like music in its softest key, or to rich, deep tones, though it be done artificially, has an extraordinary effect on the character and on others. It is associated with a well-trained mind and one gifted with self-control. One of the richest voices to which I ever listened was that of the poet Tennyson. I can remember another man of marvelous mind, vast learning, and aesthetic poetic power who also had one of those voices which exercised great influence on all who heard it. There is an amusing parallel as regards nasal screaming voices in the fact that a donkey 
cannot bray unless he at the same time lifts his tail. But if the tail be tied down, the beast must be silent. So the man or woman, whose voice like that of the Errol Kings is ghostly shrill as the wind in the porch of a ruined church, always raise their tones with their temper. But if we keep the former down by training, the latter cannot rise. I once asked a very talented lady teacher of elocution in Philadelphia if she regarded shrill voices as incurable. She replied that they invariably yielded to instruction and training. Children under no domestic restraint who were allowed to scream out and dispute on all occasions and were never corrected in intonation, generally had vulgar voices. A good voice acts very evidently on the latent powers of the mind and impresses the aesthetic sense even when it is unheeded by the conscious judgment. Many a clergyman makes a deep impression by his voice alone and why? Certainly not by appealing to the reason. Therefore, it is well to be able to fascinate with the voice. Now, nota bene, as almost every human being can speak in a soft or well-toned voice, at least subdued unto a temperate tone, just as long as he or she chooses to do it, it follows that, with foresight, aided by suggestion or continued will, we can all acquire this enviable accomplishment. To end this chapter with a curious bit of appropriate folklore, I would record that while Saxo Grammaticus, Olaus Magnus, and a host of other Norsemen have left legends to prove that there were sorcerers who by magic or the soft and wondrous voice could charm and capture men of the sword, so the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher declares that on the 17th day of May, 1638, he, going from Messina in a boat, witnessed with his own eyes the capture not of swordsmen, but of sundry zifio, swordfish, by means of a melodiously chanted charm, the words whereof he noted down as follows. Mamasudi di Pajanu, Paletu di Pajanu, Mashasu stignata, Paletu di Pajanu, Pale la stagnata, Mancata stignata, Pronastu varitu presudu, Visu ad terra. Of which words Kircher declares that they are probably of mingled corrupt Greek and ancient Sicilian but that, whatever they are, they certainly are admirable for the catching of fish. End of chapter 9 Recording by Roz Mason in Portland, Oregon rosmason.com r-a-z-m-a-s-o-n dot com of the mystic will this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by pamela krantz the mystic will by charles godfrey leland chapter 10 the subliminal self while the previous pages of this work were in the press I received and read a very interesting and able book entitled Telepathy and the Subliminal Self, or an account of recent investigations regarding hypnotism, automatism, dreams, phantoms, and related phenomena, by R. Osgood Mason, A.M., Fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine. Dr. Mason, on the whole, may be said to follow Hartman, 
since he places thaumaturgy or working what have been considered as wonders miracles and the deeds of spiritualists on the evolutionary or material basis he is also far less superstitious or prone to seek the miraculous and mysterious for its own sake than his predecessors in occulta and limits his beliefs to proofs sustained by good authority he recognizes a second or what he calls a subliminal self the spirit of our soul acting independently of waking conscious judgment a mysterious alter ego which has marvellous power this second or inner self i have also through this work of mine recognized as a reality though it is like the self-conscious soul rather an aggregate than a distinct unity thus we may for convenience sake speak of the memory when there are in fact millions of memories since every image stored away in the brain is one and the faculty of revising them for the use of the waking soul is certainly apart from the action of bringing them into play in dreams in fact if we regard the action of all known faculties we might assume with the egyptians that man had not merely eight distinct souls but eighty or even a countless number and as the ancients knowing very little about mental action classed it all as one soul so we may call that which is partially investigated and mysterious a second or inner soul spirit or subliminal self that is to say provisionally till more familiar with its nature and relations dr mason to his credit be it said has not accepted for gospel as certain french writers have done the tricks of self-confessed humbugs he has only given us the cream of the most strictly attested cases as related by french scientists and people of unquestioned veracity and yet admitting that in every instance the witness sincerely believed that he or she spoke the truth the aggregate is so far from confirming the tales told that consideration and comparison would induce very grave doubt thus who could have been more sincere purely honest or pious than justinus kerner whom i knew personally swedenborg eschenmeyer and all of their school yet how utterly irreconcilable are all their revelations therefore while i have cited illustration and example as affording unproved or hearsay evidence i in fact decidedly reject not only all tradition as proof on occult subjects but all assertion from any quarter however trustworthy asking the reader to believe in nothing which he cannot execute and make sure unto himself tradition and testimony are very useful to supply ideas or theories but to actually believe in anything beyond his experience a man should take sufficient interest in it to prove it by personal experiment and therefore as i have already declared i not only ask but hope that no reader will put faith in anything which i have alleged or declared until he has fully and fairly proved it to be true in his own person the history of true culture truth or progress has been that of doubt or disbelief in all which cannot be scientifically proved or made manifest to sensation and reflection and even in this the most scrupulous care must be exercised since our senses often deceive us therefore in dealing with subjects which have undeniably been made the means of deceit and delusion thousands of times to one authentic instance it is not well to accept testimony or any kind of evidence or proof save that which we can establish for ourself the day is not yet but it is coming when self-evidence will be claimed and granted as to all human knowledge and the sooner it comes the better will it be for the world but i would be clearly understood as declaring that it is only as regards making up our minds to absolute faith in what involves what may be called our mental welfare which includes the most serious conduct of life that i would limit belief to scientific proof as an example i will cite the very interesting case of the hypnotic treatment of a patient by dr voisin and as given by mason in the summer of eighteen eighty four 
there was at the salpetriere a young woman of a deplorable type jean s who was a criminal lunatic filthy violent and with a life history of impurity and crime m auguste de voisin one of the physicians of the staff undertook to hypnotize her may thirty first at that time she was so violent that she could only be kept quiet by a straitjacket and the constant cold douche to her head she would not look at m voisin but raved and spat at him he persisted kept his face near and opposite to hers and his eyes following hers constantly in ten minutes she was in a sound sleep and soon passed into a somnambulistic condition the process was repeated many days and she gradually became sane while in the hypnotic condition but still raved when she woke gradually then she began to accept hypnotic suggestion and would obey trivial orders given her while asleep such as to sweep her room then suggestions regarding her general behavior then in her hypnotic condition she began to express regret for her past life and form resolutions of amendment to which she finally adhered when she awoke two years later she was a nurse in one of the paris hospitals and her conduct was irreproachable m voisin has followed up this case by others equally striking this is not only an unusually well authenticated instance but one which seems to carry conviction from the manner of narration yet it would be absurd to declare that the subject neither deceived herself nor others or that the doctor made no mistakes either in fact or involuntarily the whole is however extremely valuable from its probability and still more from its suggesting experiment in a much more useful direction than that followed in the majority of cases recorded in most books which especially in france seem chiefly to have been conducted from a melodramatic or merely medical point of view very few indeed seem to have ever dreamed that a hypnotized subject was anything but a being to be cured of some disorder operated on without pain or made to undergo and perform various tricks often extremely cruel silly and wicked the main object of all being to advertise the skill of the operator in fact if it were to be accepted that the main object of hypnotism is to repeat such experiments as are described in most of the french works on the subject humanity and decency would join in prohibiting the practice of the art altogether these books point out and make clear in the minutest manner how every kind of crime can be committed and the mind brought to regard all that is evil as a matter of course the making an innocent person attempt to commit a murder or steal is among the most unusual experiments while on the contrary any case like that of the reform of jean s is either very rare or else is treated simply as a proof of the skill of some medico the fact that if the successes which are recorded are true there exists a stupendous power by means of which the average morality and happiness of mankind can be incredibly advanced and sustained and education art in every branch and in a word all culture be marvelously developed on a far more secure basis than in the old systems does not seem to have occurred to any of those who possessed as it were gold without having the least idea of its value or even its qualities happiness in the main is a pleasant contented condition of the mind that is to say a state of mind to be perfect as appears from an enlarged study of all things or phenomena in their relations since every part must harmonize with the whole this happiness implies duty and altruism every wit as much as self-enjoyment this agrees with and results from scientific experience under the old a priori psychologic system selfishness which meant that every soul was to be chiefly or solely concerned in saving itself guided by hope of reward and fear of punishment it was naturally the basis of morality 
now accepting the definition of happiness as a state of mind under certain conditions it follows that it can be realized to a great degree and in all cases to some degree firstly by forethought or carefully defining what it is or what we desire and secondly by making a fixed idea by simple well-nigh mechanical means without any resource to les grands moyens according to the old and now rapidly vanishing philosophy this was to be effected by sublime morality prayer or adjuration of supernatural beings and noble heroism but what is here proposed is much humbler albeit more practical reading immortal poetry or prose is indeed a splendid power but to learn the letters of the alphabet and to spell is very simple and unpoetic yet far more practical what i have described has been the mere dull rudiments it is most remarkable that the world has always known that the art of raphael michael angelo and albert durer was based like that of the greatest musicians on extensive rudimentary study and yet has never dreamed that what far surpasses all art in every way and even includes the desire for it may all proceed from or be developed by a process which is even easier than those required for the lesser branches he who can control his own mind by an iron will and say to the thoughts which he would banish be ye my slaves and be gone into outer darkness or to peace dwell with me forever come what may and be obeyed that man is a mighty magician who has attained what is worth more than all that earth possesses absolute self-control under the conditions before defined since our happiness to be true must agree with that of others is absolutely essential to happiness there can be no greater hero than the man who can conquer himself and think exactly as he pleases that which annoys tempts stirs us to being irritable wicked or mean is an aggregate of evil thoughts or images received by chance or otherwise into the memory developed there into vile unions and new forms like coalescing animalcule and so powerful and vivid or objective do they become that men in all ages have given them a real existence as evil spirits every sane man living can if he really desires it obtain complete absolute command of himself exorcise these vile demons and bring in peace instead by developing with determination the simple process which i have described i have found in my own experience a fierce pleasure in considering obnoxious and pernicious thoughts as imps or demons to be conquered in which case pride and even arrogance become virtues even as poisons in their place are wholesome medicines thus he who is haunted with the fixed idea even well nigh to monomania that he will never give way to ill temper that nothing shall disturb his equanimity need not fear evil results any more than the being haunted by angels now we can all have fixed or haunting ideas on any subject which we please to entertain but the idea to create good and beneficent haunting has not that i am aware been suggested by philosophers that mental influence can be exerted hypnotically most directly and certainly by one person upon another is undeniable but this requires firstly a susceptible subject or only one person in three or four and to a degree a specially gifted operator and very often heaven-sent moments however greatly mortals may require it all cannot go to corneth who desire it but forethought self-suggestion and the bringing the mind to dwell continuously on a subject are absolutely within the reach of all who have any strength of mind whatever without any aid those of feebler ability yield however all the more readily as in the case of children to the influence of others or of hypnotism by a master therefore either subjectively or with assistance most human beings can be morally benefited to a limitless degree morally including intellectually we often hear it said of a person that he or she would do well or succeed if that individual had application 
now as application or sticking to it or perseverance in earnest faith is the main condition for success in all that i have discussed i trust that it will be borne in mind that the process indicated provides from the first lesson or experiment for this chief requisite for the forethinking and hypnotizing our minds to be in a certain state or condition all the next day by what some writers such as hartman treat as magical process but which is just so much magical as the use of an electrical machine is simply a beginning in attention and perseverance so like a snowball rolled in falling snow it gathers size as it doth onward go when we make a wish or will or determine that in future after awaking we shall be in a given state of mind we also include perseverance for the given time and as success supposes repetition in all minds it follows that perseverance will be induced gradually and easily and here i may remark that while all writers on ethics duty or morals cry continually be persevering be honest be enterprising exert your will and so on and waste thousands of books in illustrating the advantages of all these fine things there is not one who tells us how to practically execute or do them to follow the hint of a quaint sunday school picture they show us a swarm of bees with hive and honey but do not tell us how to catch one and yet a man may be anything he pleases if he will by easy and simple practice as i have shown make the conception habitual i do not tell you as these good folk do how to go about it nobly or heroically or piously in fact i prescribe a method as humble as making a fire or a pair of shoes and yet in very truth and honor i have profited far more by it than i ever did from all the exhortations which i have ever read now there are many men who are not so bad in themselves in reality but who are so haunted by evil thoughts impulses and desires that they being taught by the absurd old heathenish psychology that the soul is all one spiritual entity believe themselves to be as wicked as beelzebub could wish when in fact these sins are nothing but evil weeds which came into the mind as neglected seeds and grew apace from sheer carelessness regarding them in the light as one may say of bodily and material nuisances or a kind of vermin they can be extirpated by the strong hand of will much more easily than under the old system whereby they were treated with respect and awe as milton hath done and most immorally too dante being no better and they would both have exerted their gigantic intellects to better purpose by showing man how to conquer the devil instead of exalting and exaggerating his stupendous power and showing how as regards humanity for which expressly the universe including countless millions of solar systems was created satan has by far the victory since he secures the majority of souls for saying which thing a holy bishop once got himself into no end of trouble i say that he who uses his will can crush and drive out vile haunting thoughts and the more rudely and harshly he does it the better in all the old systems without exception they are treated with far too much respect and reverence and no great wonder either since they were regarded as a great innate portion of the soul whether to be cleared out by the allopathic exorcism or the gentler homeopathic prayer the patient never relied on himself there is a fine italian proverb in the collection of guilloverino venice sixteen fifty six which declares that buona volenta supplicia facolta strong will ekes out ability and before the will which the church has ever weakened or crushed no evil instincts can hold the same author tells us that the greatest man in the world is he who can govern his own will also to him who wills naught is impossible to which i would add that whoever chooses to have a will may do so by culture or by ever so little to begin with 
nay i have no doubt that in time there will be societies schools churches or circles in which the will shall be taught and applied to all moral and mental culture he who wills it sincerely can govern his will and he who can govern his will is a thousand times more fortunate than if he could govern the world for to govern the will is to be without fear superior and indifferent to all earthly follies and shams idols cants and delusions it is to be lord of a thousand isles in the sea of life and absolutely greater than any living mortal as men exist small need has that man to heed what his birth or station in society may be who has mastered himself with the iron will for he who has conquered death and the devil need fear no shadows he who masters himself by will has attained to all that is best and noblest in stoicism epicureanism christianity and agnosticism if the latter be understood not as doubt but free inquiry and could men be made to feel what all this means and what power it bestows and how easily it really is to master it we should forthwith see all humanity engaged in the work it has been declared by many in the past in regard to schooling their minds to moral and practical ends that leading busy lives they had not time to think of such matters but i earnestly protest that it is these very men of all others who most require the discipline which i have taught and it is as easy for them as for anybody as it indeed ought to be easier yes and far more profitable for the one who leads by fortune a quiet life of leisure can often school himself without a system while he who toils amid anxious thoughts and with every mental power severely taxed will find that he can do his work far more easily if he determines that he will master it the amount of mental action which lies dormant in us all is illimitable and it can all be realized by the hypnotism of will End of chapter 10 the subliminal self recording by pamela krantz Twelve of the Mystic Will. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. The Mystic Will by Charles Godfrey Leland. Chapter Eleven. Paracelsus. That our ordinary consciousness or waking intellect and what is generally recognized as mind or soul includes whatever has been taken in by sensation and reflection and assimilated to daily wants, or shows itself in bad or good memories and thought, is evident. Not less clear is it that there is another hidden self, a power which, recognizing much which is evil in the mind, would fain reject or rule or subdue it this latent inner intelligence calls into action the will all of this is vague and it may be unscientific it is more rational to believe in many faculties or functions but the classification here suggested may serve as a basis it is effectively that of grasner or of all who have recognized the power of the will to work miracles guided by a higher morality and it is very curious that paracelsus based his whole system of nervous cure at least on this theory thus in the liber entium morborum de ente spirituali chapter three he writes as we have shown that there are two subjecta this will we assume as our ground ye know that there is in the body a soul geisten now reflect to what purpose just that it may sustain life even as the air keeps animals from dying for want of breath so we know what the soul is this soul in man is actually clear intelligible and sensible to the other soul and classing them they are to be regarded as allied even as bodies are i have a soul the other hath also one Paracelsus is here very obscure, but he manifestly means by the other, the body. To resume. The souls know one another as I, 
and the other they converse together in their language not by necessity according to our thoughts but what they will and note too that there may be anger between them and one may belittle or injure the other this injury is in the soul the soul in the body then the body suffers and is ill not materially or from a material ends but from the soul for this we need spiritual remedy ye are two who are dear unto one another great in affinity the cause is not in the body nor is it from without it comes from your souls geisten who are allied the same pair may be inimical or remain so and that ye may understand a cause for this note that the spirit geist of the reasoning faculty vernunft is not born save from the will therefore the will and the reason are separate what exists and acts according to the will lives in the spirit what only according to the reason lives against the spirit for the reason brings forth no spirit only the soul seal is born of it from will comes the spirit the essence of which we describe and let the soul be in this grandly conceived but most carelessly written passage the author in the beginning thereof makes such confusion in expressing both soul and spirit with the one word geist that his real meaning could not be intelligible to the reader who had not already mastered the theory but in fact the whole conception is marvellous and closely agreeing with the latest discoveries in science while ignoring all the old psychological system very significant is what paracelsus declares in his fragmenta medicina de morbis somnii that so many evils beset us caused by the coarseness of our ignorance because we know not what is born in us that is to say if we knew our mental power or what we are capable of we could cure or control all bodily infirmities and how to rule and form this power and make it obey the geist or will which paracelsus believed was born of the common conscious soul that is the question for paracelsus truly believed that out of this common soul the result of sensation and reflection and all we pick up by experience and observation and such as makes all that there is of life for most people there is born or results a perception of ideas of right and wrong of mutual interests a certain subtle moral conscience or higher knowledge the souls may become inimical that is the conscience or spirit may differ or disagree with the soul as a son may be at variance with his father so the flower or fruit may oft despise the root the will is allied to conscience or a perception of the ideal when a man finds out that he knows more or better than he has hitherto done as for instance when a thief learns that it is wrong to steal and feels it deeply he endeavors to reform although he feels all the time old desires and temptations to rob now if he resolutely subdue these his will is born the spirit of the reasoning faculty is not born save of the will what exists and acts according to the will lives in the spirit the perception of ideals is the bud conscience the flower and the will the fruit a pure will must be moral for it is the result of the perception of ideals or a conscience the world in general regards will as mere blind force applicable to good or bad indifferently but the more truly and fully it is developed or as orson is raised to valentine the more moral and optimistic does it become will in its perfection is genius spontaneous originality that is voluntary not merely a power to lift a weight or push a load or force others to yield but the thought itself which suggests the deed and finds a reason for it now the merely unscrupulous use of opportunity and advantage or crime is popularly regarded as having a strong will but this as compared to a will with a conscience is as the craft of the fox compared to that of the dragon and that of the dragon to siegfried 
and here it may be observed as a subtle and strange thing approaching to magic apparently as understood by hartmann and his school that the will sometimes when much developed actually manifests something like an independent personality or at least seems to do so to an acute observer and what is more remarkable it can have this freedom of action and invention delegated to it and will act on it thus in conversation with Herkomer, the artist and dr w w baldwin november second eighteen seventy eight the former explained to me that when he would execute a work of art he just determined it with care or forethought in his mind and gave it a rest as by sleep during which time it unconsciously fructified or germinated even as a seed when planted in the ground at last grows upward into the light and air now that the entire work should not be too much finished or quite completed and to leave room for afterthoughts or possible improvements he was wont as he said to give the will some leeway or freedom which is the same thing as if before going to sleep we will or determine that on the following day our imagination or creative force or inventive genius shall be unusually active which will come to pass after some small practice and a few repetitions as all may find for themselves truly it will be according to conditions for if there be but little in a man either he will bring but little out or else he must wait until he can increase what he hath and in this the will seems to act like an independent person ingeniously yet withal obedient and the same also characterizes images in dreams which sometimes appear to be so real that it is no wonder many think they are spirits from another world as is true of many haunting thoughts which come unbidden however this is all mere thaumaturgy which has been so deadly to truth in the old a priori psychology and still works mischief albeit it has its value in suggesting very often in poetry what science afterwards proves in prose to return to paracelsus heine complains that his german is harder to understand than his latin however i think that in the following passages he shows distinctly a familiarity with hypnotism or certainly passes by hand and suggestion thus chapter ten de ente spirituali in which the will is described begins as follows now shall ye mark that the spirits rule their subjects and i have shown intelligibly how the ens spirituali or spiritual being rules so mightily the body that many disorders may be ascribed to it therefore unto these ye should not apply ordinary medicine but heal the spirit therein lies the disorder paracelsus clearly states that by the power of foresight he uses the exact word fürsicht man may aided by sleep attain to knowledge past present or future and achieve telepathy or communion at a distance in the fragmenta caput de morbis somnii he writes therefore learn that by foresight man can know future things and from experience the past and present thereby is man so highly gifted in nature that he knows or perceives zicht as he goes his neighbor or friend in a distant land yet on waking he knows nothing of all this for god has given to us all art wisdom reason to know the future and what passes in distant lands but we know it not for we fools busied in common things sleep away as it were what is in us thus seeing one who is a better artist than thou art do not say that he has more gift or grace than thou for thou hast it also but hast not tried and so is it with all things what adam and moses did was to try and they succeeded and it came neither from the devil nor from spirits but from the light of nature which they developed in themselves but we do not seek for what is in us therefore we remain nothing and are nothing here the author very obscurely yet vigorously declares that we can do or learn what we will but it must be achieved by foresight will and the aid of sleep 
it seems very evident after careful study of the text that here as in many other places our author indicates familiarity with the method of developing mental action in its subtlest and most powerful forms firstly by determined foresight and secondly by the aid of sleep corresponding to the bringing a seed to rest a while and thereby cause it to germinate the which admirable simile he himself uses in a passage which i have not cited paracelsus was the most original thinker and the worst writer of a wondrous age when all wrote badly and thought badly there is in his german writings hardly one sentence which is not ungrammatical confused or clumsy nor one without a vigorous idea which shows the mind or character of the man as a curious instance of the poetic originality of paracelsus we may take the following it is an error to suppose that chiromancy is limited to the hand for there are significant lines indicating character all over the body and it is so in vegetable life for in a plant every leaf is a hand man hath too a tree many and every one reveals its anatomy a hand anatomy now ye shall understand that in double form the lines are masculine or feminine and there are as many differences in these lines on leaves as in human hands goethe has the credit that he reformed or advanced the science of botany by reducing the plant to the leaf as the germ or type and this is now further reduced to the cell but the step was a great one did not paracelsus however give the idea the theory of signatures says vaughan in his hours with the mystics proceeded on the supposition that every creature bears in some part of its structure the indication of the character or virtue inherent in it the representation in fact of its ideal or soul the student of sympathies thus essayed to read the character of plants by signs in their organization as the professor of palmistry announced that of men by lines in the hand thus to a degree which is very little understood paracelsus took a great step towards modern science he disclaimed magic and sorcery with ceremonies and endeavored to base all cure on human will the name of paracelsus is now synonymous with rosicrucianism alchemy elementary spirits and theurgy when in fact he was in his time a bold reformer who cast aside an immense amount of old superstition and advanced into what his age regarded as terribly free thought he was compared to luther and the doing so greatly pleased him he dwells on it at length in one of his works what paracelsus really believed in at heart was nothing more or less than an unfathomable nature a natura naturans of infinite resource connected with which as a microcosm is man who has also within him infinite powers which he can learn to master by cultivating the will which must be begun at least by the aid of sleep or letting the resolve ripen as it were in the mind apart from consciousness i had written every line of my work on the same subject and principles long before i was aware that i had unconsciously followed exactly in the footprints of the great master for though i had made many other discoveries in his books i knew nothing of this End of chapter eleven paracelsus recording by pamela krantz of, of the mystic will this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mystic will by charles godfrey leland chapter twelve last words by carrying calves milo tis said grew strong until with ease he bore a bull along it is i believe unquestionable that if he ever lived a man who had attained to absolute control over his own mind must have been the most enviable of mortals 
Montaigne illustrates such an ideal being by a quotation from Virgil. Velut rupis vastum qua prodit in aquor, ob via venturum foris exposta cui ponto, vim cumptum act minas perfert calic marisc ipsa imota manens. He as a rock among vast billows stood, scorning loud winds and the wild raging flood, and firm remaining all the force defies from the grim threatening seas and thundering skies. And Montaigne also doubted whether such self-control was possible. He remarks of it. Let us never attempt these examples. We shall never come up to them. This is too much and too rude for our common souls to undergo. Cato indeed gave up the noblest life that ever was upon this account. But it is for us meaner-spirited men to fly from the storm as far as we can. Is it? I may have thought so once, but I begin to believe that in this darkness a new strange light is beginning to show itself. The victory may be won far more easily than the rather indolent and timid essayist ever imagined. Montaigne and many more believed that absolute self-control is only to be obtained by iron effort, heroic and terrible exertion a conception based on bygone history, which is all a record of battles of man against man, or man with the devil. Now the world is beginning slowly to make an ideal of peace, and disbelieve in the devil. Science is attempting to teach us that from any beginning, however small, great results are sure to be obtained if resolutely followed up and fully developed. It requires thought to realize what a man gifted to some degree with culture and common sense must enjoy who can review the past without pain and regard the present with perfect assurance that come what may he need have no fear or fluttering of the heart spencer has asked in the fate of the butterfly what more felicity can fall to creature than to enjoy delight with liberty to which one may truly reply that all delight is fitful and uncertain unless bound or blended with the power to be indifferent to involuntary annoying emotions and that self-command is in itself the highest mental pleasure or one which surpasses all of any kind he who does not overestimate the value of money or anything earthly is really richer than the millionaire there is a foolish story told by Combe in his Physiology of a Man, who had the supernatural gift of never feeling any pain, be it from cold, hunger, heat, or accident. The rain beat upon him in vain. The keenest north wind did not chill him. He was fearless and free. But this immunity was coupled with an inability to feel pleasure. His wine or ale was no more to his palate than water and he could not feel the kiss of his child, and so we are told he was soon desirous to become a creature subject to all physical sensations as before. But it is, as I said, a foolish tale, because it reduces all that is worth living for to being warm or enjoying taste. His mind was not affected, but that goes for nothing in such sheer sensuality. However, a man without losing his tastes or appetites may train his will to so master emotion as to enjoy delight with liberty, and also exclude what constitutes the majority of all suffering with man. It is a truth that there is very often an extremely easy, simple, and prosaic way to attain many an end, which has always been supposed to require stupendous efforts. In an Italian fairy tale, a prince besieges a castle with an army, trumpets blowing, banners waving, and all the pomp and circumstances of war, to obtain a beautiful heroine, who was meanwhile carried away by a rival, who knew of a subterranean passage. Hitherto, as I have already said, men have sought for self-control only by means of heroic exertion, or by besieging the castle from without. The simple system of forethought and self-suggestion enables one, as it were, to steal or slip away with ease by night 
and in darkness that fairest of princesses la volonté or the will for he who wills to be equable and indifferent to the small and involuntary annoyances teasing memories irritating trifles which constitute the chief trouble in life to most folk can bring it about in small measure at first and in due time to greater perfection and by perseverance this rivulet may go to a river run the river fall into a mighty lake and this in time rush to the roaring sea that is to say from bearing with indifference or quite evading attacks of ennui we may come to enduring great afflictions with little suffering note that i do not say that we can come to bearing all the bereavements losses and trials of life with absolute indifference here in montaigne and the stoics of old were well nigh foolish to imagine such an impossible and indeed undesirable ideal but it may be that two men are afflicted by the same domestic loss and one with a weak nature is well nigh crushed by it gives himself up to endless weeping and perhaps never recovers from it while another with quite as deep feelings but far wiser rallies and by vigorous exertion makes the grief a stimulus to exertion so that while the former is demoralized the latter is strengthened there is an habitual state of mind by which a man while knowing his losses fully can endure them better than others and this endurance will be greatest in him who has already cultivated it assiduously in minor matters he who has swam in the river can swim in the sea he who can hear a door bang without starting can listen to a cannon without jumping the method which i have described in this book will enable any person gifted with perseverance to make an equable or calm state of mind habitual moderately at first more so by practice and when this is attained the experimenter can progress rapidly in the path it is precisely the same as in learning a minor art the pupil who can design a pattern which corresponds to foresight or plan only requires as in wood carving or repousse to be trained by very easy process to become familiar with the use and feel of the tools after which all that remains to be done is to keep on at what the pupil can do without the least difficulty well begun and well run in the end will be well done but glorious and marvelous is the power of him who has habituated himself by easy exercise of will to brush away the minor meaningless and petty cares of life such as however prey on most of us for unto him great griefs are no harder to endure than the getting a coat splashed is to an ordinary man end of chapter twelve and end of the mystic will by charles godfrey leland